It's time for security now. Steve Gibson's here. And we have a great show planned for you. Not only some security news, but a little later on in the show, an interview with the two guys who <laughs> hacked the car Leslie Stahl was driving in during 60 minutes. We're going to talk about vehicle hacking and why it's going to be and may already be a huge problem. Stay tuned. Security Now is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Security Now is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 497, recorded March 3rd, 2015. Hacking Vehicles. Security Now is brought to you by IT Pro TV. A good IT pro is always learning, and IT Pro TV is the resource to keep your IT skills and knowledge up to date. IT Pro TV offers engaging courses streamed to your Roku, Chromecast, computer, or mobile device for a free seven day trial and 30% off the lifetime of your account. Go to itpro.tv slash security now and use the code SN30. Time for Security Now, the show where we protect you, your privacy, and your security online with this guy right here, Mr. Steve Gibson. Yes, sir. You're going to do the Live Long and Prosper for us in honor oh, of... Oh, uh... I, have, I have a little mention down All in right. our miscellany today okay. because I had an encounter with Gene Roddenberry. We have an amazing show for you. Coming up a little later on, we're going to talk to two guys who are kind of heavy-duty researchers in uh, what they call f what physical security... Um, uh, they called it uh, cyber physical security. Cyber that is physical security. Attacks against physical things that we care about, like driving down the freeway in our car. Um, yes, uh, I mentioned a couple weeks ago when 60 Minutes had that segment showing a, a wireless hack of a car that the, um, the, the producer, Leslie Stahl, was driving and they and the person was in the passenger seat was part of this team who said okay now leslie pull up and stop in front of this line of orange cones so leslie pulled up to them put her foot on the brake and nothing happened and that's scary was, she plowed right into the cones yeah and and it's it's interesting because the you know as, as i mentioned later in the show I don't know how I know that I mention it later in the show, but I'm psychic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we just, to pierce the veil of secrecy, we recorded the second half first because we wanted to let the Lee and the Pat, our guests, get, get going in their life. I so. got out of my time machine and came back to, <laughs> we are, to meet with Leo. We are edited this to be in a, in a different order than the actual in recording order. In standard podcast order, yes. right. With, with top of the show news and then uh, then our interview, um, but it's it's surprisingly jarring when all our lives we've pushed our you know pushed down the brake pedal and the car slows down and stops to push down the brake pedal and have the car not stop and it turns out that I was just naively assuming there would still be a physical backup that, that you, we wouldn't entirely be relying on fly-by-wire technology. But these guys explain in the future that, uh, in fact, what's happened is uh, pressures for uh, lightening the weight, lowering the cost, uh, adding features, all of these things have have sort of come together to to turn these cars into rolling computer networks with upwards of 50 different so-called ECUs, um, the, the individual computers scattered around the car. So for example, th there'll be DC supplied to the whole array of lights along the back of the car and the CAN bus runs over and over the CAN bus comes the instructions for which lights to turn on and off. There isn't, you know, used to be there was a big wiring harness. A physical where, wire that goes to the back. Yeah, yeah point to point. Right, where, all, where the big bundle of cables went back to all the specific lights that you want. Now they just send it DC. But that and, makes sense because and, uh, we're used to that with, with networking and it makes sense. Have a central bus and send signals to different components. Yep, That's and in the future, one and in the future, one of these guys will say, "Yes, 
the CAN bus is the best network that the 80s could ever come up with. <laughs> That's a pull quote from the future, ladies and gentlemen. I look forward to, to, to that. But you have, you have some other uh, security news to talk about, too, I know. Yeah, so uh, this week we're going to talk about uh, another uh, Soho router backdoor, um, an interesting but not yet perfect web-based encryption service, which is a little bit of a lesson for our audience. I thought they'd get a kick out of um, and I just wanted to make a note of, of the weeks of a blurb that came up during the week about creating an internet service and having your life threatened. Um, and then two little blurbs about the evolution of DNS and search, some miscellaneous stuff. And then our main feature of the week, which is this report on hacking vehicles from the guys who have done it. So, uh, with there, otherwise there wasn't really much, you know, horrifying security news <laughs> so instead the entire topic of the show having your car hacked is somewhat <laughs> horrifying we uh we are brought to you today by uh, our good buddies here at uh, itpro.tv i talk to them talk about them a lot I talk to them a lot too tim and don actually uh, come out frequently uh we've been planning a trip out there um in fact we first met i think at the nab uh, a couple of uh, years ago um, I did a Broadcast Minds panel. In fact, I'm doing one at NAB uh, in April uh, this year, if you can come. Um, and they came and they got inspired. They had been for years teaching, uh, you know, uh, people so they could get their certs, you know, giving them the coaching they needed to get, you know, their uh, their MCSEs or their CCNAs and all of that. And they thought, you know, what we could do, Must a light went on. over. We could do kind of what Leo does with TWIT, only for IT uh, training. And that's when they started IT Pro TV. And I have to say, uh, more than a year in now, they joined, you know, they started advertising almost immediately. And they have just been a huge success. And I can't take credit for it. I'll, I'll take a little bit of the credit, but really they're creating something so useful. Hundreds of hours of content now. They add 30 hours each week. They do it live just like we do. You can even chat with them if you wish. Um, there's so many courses. They've got a search because there's just so much stuff in there. The episodes include courses on Apple and Microsoft and Cisco. You've got A+, CCNA, Security+, MCSA, CISSP, PowerShell, Linux. They cover network security, Linux, Windows, and OS 10 support for desktop servers. I love the virtual uh, machine sandbox lab. If you've got an HTML5 browser on any OS, you could, you could be using a Chromebook. And you can set up, configure Windows servers, set up clients in their virtual machines. Their measure up practice exams give you a chance to see how you're doing at no extra fee. That's worth 79 bucks. You pay once a month or once a year if you want. The low fee gives you daily updates, new features, no hassle cancellation. Uh, and I'll tell you, it's less than the cost of a study guide and certainly a lot cheaper than going to an IT boot camp. You also get to interact with the host during chat. Let's just see. I'm curious if they're on air. Uh, right now, you can just click the on air thing. Actually, I know they're not because the red blinking light next to on air would tell you. But you see, they got the chat. It looks very much like what we do. You could pop out the chat. You can watch on a Roku or your computer or your tablet. In fact, if you buy uh, the subscription yearly, you can even download content and, and watch offline. Corporate and group pricing available. Clients include HP, UCSD, Stanford, even MIT studies with IT Pro TV. ITPro.tv slash security now, right now, and upgrade your brain with the most popular IT certs recognized by employers. Normally, if you go to the uh, the pricing area, you'll see subscriptions are $57 a month or $570 for an entire year. But we've got, a, of course, a special offer, a free seven-day trial and 30% off. Just use the offer code SN30. And that's not 30% off for the first month or year. That's forever. Forever. So that makes it less than $40 a month, $399 for the entire year. It's a great deal. They've just announced, I'm really pleased, They the, we, we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, they're doing a course for Certified Ethical Hacker Cert, which I love. And they have signed up their subject matter uh, expert, Sean Philip Oriano. Uh, this is their most requested course to date. And I'm not surprised. I want to take it. Sean's awesome. He's an expert in security. He literally wrote the book on CEH. Uh, his teaching and consulting, consulting experience includes enterprise and military clients, too. 
Uh, they'll be streaming live starting Monday, uh, March 23rd. So 20 days from today, they're going to start this. It'll be uh, 9 a.m. They're going to really do it, too, by the way. 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern all week through Friday, April 3rd. So, uh, I, I, you know what? Put it on the Roku and just, like, spend the day uh, with Sean and learn how to be a certified ethical hacker. And, by the way, I got to point this out. Their live stream is available to everyone, even with the basic account that's free. So I two weeks of certified ethical hacking. You don't even have to pay for it, but it starts March 23rd from 9 to 4. Get in there right now, itpro.tv slash security now. And if you you know use the code SN30 to try it free for seven days and get 30% off. And I think it's so cool that they're making the certified ethical hacker course part of the basic free basic subscription. That is just great. A great way to get introduced to IT Pro TV. ITPro.tv slash security now. I always have to tip my hat to Tim and Don. I mean, they just I'm so I'm so proud of them. They have just taken off in the year they've been with us. Uh, okay, Steve. Let's see. What do we got? So um this generated a lot of Twitter traffic because it seemed really severe. Um upon closer inspection, it's real, but it's sort of a corner of the net. Still, I wanted to bring it to people's attention, if for no other reason than to, to reinforce the importance of something we've been long saying. What was discovered by a couple guys who reverse engineered the firmware that they found on their own router in there, and these are security re researchers who presented their findings to the International Conference on Cybersecurity and Cyber Law uh, a couple of weeks ago on February 21st was that there was an undocumented backdoor because in their firmware, the password super S U P E R for both username and password was burned into embedded and hidden in the firmware alongside whatever username and password the user would assign. So, that meant that this particular router they had would respond with no other documentation about this anywhere if you used super twice for username and password. And they then did a partial scan of the Internet and found two, more than 200,000 routers sitting on the net into which they were able to log using super for the username and password. Now, the good news is none of these are big brand name routers. Well, although Realtek is a name we recognize, although they're, they're, they're big for, for network interface cards, and TrendNet is a name I know, but Digicom, Alpha Network, ProLink, Planet Networks, Bless, SmartGate, and BlueLink are the among the model numbers, it makes the models of routers that they have found. And, you know, these are all, it, it looks like, like there's, some sort of an underground router firmware that's being shared. Like these are sort of off-brand routers. The hardware has become commoditized. So you get, you know, you build commodity hardware, stick your logo on the front, and then you get this, they're not sure where it came from, firmware that happens to have super as the username and password. So, you know, maybe the bargain basement router is making you vulnerable. The problem is that this particular router, as evidenced by the fact that at least 200,000 of them have been found, um, has the WAN admin enabled by default, which means all of those routers they were able to log into. And right now, today, those are all um, completely open to remote exploitation. So, again... You, you absolutely want to make sure not only that your router doesn't respond to super as its username and password, but that you have explicitly disabled WAN interface. We know that that's not complete protection because we've been covering stories where routers will still respond to magic Ethernet packets or to, you know, like funky packets on some strange port uh, because the the designers of the router wanted to have admin access sort of off the record which but is it, just not a safe thing to do did they say the brand 
Um, yeah, uh, there's a bunch of these. It's uh, it's on that next page of, of the show notes, Leo. Oh, yeah, yeah, Digicom, yeah. Alpha Network, and so forth. So they've they've identified oh, yeah, yeah. The, what they did was they scanned the internet and found all of these routers. Uh, when they logged in, the router said, "Yeah, oh, I'm yeah, a Digicom." Super, super. D- yeah. <laughs> hey, super, super. Yeah. Exactly. Well, if you turn off WAN administration, then they'd have to have physical access. So that at least. But there's no other way to mitigate that, right? I mean, that's just built into the firmware. Correct. Um, and so, so again, the, the other lesson here, I think, is that what we're seeing is that router firmware is too much on the front line to leave it up to the manufacturers. I don't, I, I'm here to, to say now in 2015, given that there is well-documented, well-scrutinized, third-party, open-source replacement firmware that's what you should be using the the tomato firmware and the ddwrt firmware um and there's another one too i can't um think of it of course astaro has their their platform that, that you can load in into a small um like a fanless pc uh form factor and that would make sense too but and you know we should also give just, a, a pat on the back to asus because they actually make uh, they sell routers with DDWRT in it. Perfect. So, yes. uh, I yes. mean, that's, uh, if you, I mean, the problem with DDWRT is it supports a subset of all routers. So you got to make sure you have a compatible router. Or if you buy one of these ASUS routers, it's in there and upgrades well, are not coming from ASUS. They come from DDWRT. And I like their ad. They, they said, you spoke, yeah. we listened. Yeah. Which is to say, you know, we're going to sell you a router specifically so that you are in control of the firmware. And, and I again, I think, you know, the router is our first line of defense on our networks. And we're seeing too many examples of both deliberate and inadvertent exploitation of the trust that we put in the firmware. Yeah. It's time It's time to revoke that trust, to well, say, these, nope, these... I, I'm only going to run something that I know as, essentially as my interface to the internet. But this is another case of the race to the bottom. You're selling $30 hardware. Yep. It's commodity hardware. You're not going to put any effort into it, nor, and this is even worse, are you going to patch it? You're just going to assume, ah, they'll buy a new one. Right. So those 200,000 people are probably toast. They're, they're, they're people who did just buy some off-brand router at Staples that they had on sale because they were, you know, trying to move a bunch of them. They said, oh, this is probably as good as anything else. Well, uh, no. Do, do you like DDWRT? I mean, or do you have a preference? I don't. Um, I, I like, I, I actually like what, um, uh, what Astaro has done just because it's got... You know, for our audience, for, for for the more technical audience, it is a very powerful yeah, solution. That's a great way to go, but that um, but that requires having a PC hardware and putting multiple the operating, NICs and yeah, so it's forth. complicated. Right. Yeah, and there is Open WRT. I maybe that's the other one you were. Oh, I think that of. was the other one. Yes, yes, yeah. right. Um, and 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 tomato. A lot of people like the I've tomato. I use tomato. I, I love tomato, but I yeah, I think that's an even smaller subset of of supported routers. So yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, okay. S next up, uh, if you could show the picture of the week, Leo, I got this the big <laughs> kick out of this. I love it. <laughs> um, this is actually a screenshot of of notebook op that after I decrypted a file under a new online service. Um, this is the the GRC cipher suite ordering dot text. That's the file I've talked about, which is just readable ASCII. You know, it, it'll say you know D uh, uh, E C D H elliptic curve Diffie Hellman underscore C B C two fifty. You know, so forth. I mean, it's legible, readable ASCII, except not in this screenshot. So here's the problem: that this is a, a neat service uh, that needs a little more work. Uh, it's called Instant Cryptor, I-N-S-T-A-N-T-C-R-Y-P-T-O-R, instantcryptor.com. Um, the guys look like they've got their hearts in the right place. Um, they are, it is a browser-based, on-the-fly, very simple-to-use encryption decryption service. It's all done in the browser. Um, and then the FAQ, they explain it, and it all makes sense. 
Uh, there's no reason why you cannot do this securely in today's JavaScript in the browser. And in, in their documentation, they explain the password will be hashed with the SHA-256 algorithm. The mode for encryption is 256-bit Rindahl slash AES in CBC mode. All of our listeners know what all that means. The file blob, meaning the resulting blob, will be read as an array buffer and fed into the encryption function. The result is then uploaded to the chosen cloud service. The uploaded files are displayed in the tool and decryption works accordingly. The code of the main JavaScript file is unminified and the interested developer can have a look at it. So I, I like that. They're saying, here it is. We're not obscuring the code. We know you're going to want to see this for yourself. So there it is. And then say that they, they conclude saying the main action happens in the last two functions at the end of the file. So what they have is this browser-based service, instantcryptor.com, that runs under Firefox or Chrome, because you're going to have a little bit of browser centricity because it's going to, it's, you know, it's, it's writing, it's using code for the specific JavaScript implementation where there may be differences between browsers. And, you know, Microsoft is always lagging, so you know, it's not running on, their, on theirs yet. And it can target either Dropbox or Google Drive. So I went there. I said, I want to use Google Drive. And it took me to Google's uh, authentication permission screen and, and, and said, do you want to allow this site to have access to your Google Drive? And I said, yes. So at that point, it switched me back to there. And they said, enter a password you would like. So I typed in a password. And then it said, and, and would you like to browse for files? I clicked on the browse, and I chose the, the Cypher Suite text file that I just had sitting around. And I, and I said, go, baby. And in no time at all, it had encrypted it and uploaded it. I then went over to Google Drive, and they had created an instant cryptor folder where all of my encrypted files from this service would live. And it was absolute gibberish. Um, and then I thought, huh, okay, cool. And so I, I, I then reversed the process. But I was curious because nowhere did this mention authentication. And so I used a different password to decrypt the file. And the results are what you saw. Uh, it's a wonderful looking Unicode catastrophe. <laughs> um, so that's a problem because what that means is that they're doing encryption but not authentication. And we've talked about why this is important for years. Um, it's, you know, all good encryption not only encrypts but authenticates because although the naive user could, could be forgiven for thinking, well, you know, if they don't know the password, then they're going to get gibberish. The problem is this also doesn't detect any either accidental or malicious modification. And it and we know, and this is there have been attacks on SSL where authentication was not done correctly, where information leakage does occur. So it's theoretically possible for someone to mess around with an encrypted file that does not have an authentication wrapper around it. The proper thing to do, what these guys need to add, and I'm hoping somehow this message will get to them, is, is that after they encrypt, then they authenticate. That is, they, they take the same password or maybe a hash of that password, and they run it through. They use that to key an HMAC, which, is, which generates a, a message authentication code, and they add that to the end of the file. That's where they upload. Then when you go through decryption, the first thing they do before they decrypt is they authenticate. So they take the password you provide. They, they're already doing an SHA-256, but that's to get the encryption key. They hash out again in order to get the HMAC, the authentication key. And then they, so they, they process the file, the encrypted file, as they did when they were 
before uploading it. They do it again before decrypting it. And they verify that they get the same message authentication code as is tagged onto the end of it. When that verifies, that tells them two things. There has been no modification of the file, either inadvertently in transmission or by any malicious agent. So it verifies the contents and that the password is correct. So what they should have told me when I typed in the wrong password is, ah, sorry, that password is not the one used to encrypt this file. And then, um, and hopefully, they're also doing some password hardening. That is, be, they didn't say so. They just said SHA-256. If they're simply doing a hash of my password, then, then that's a problem because it would be possible to start doing a brute force attack if they're only doing one SHA-256 and just look at the beginning of the file until they guess something that makes the beginning of the file look correct. So anyway, it's a sort of a nice little object lesson. Simple, clean, cool service. I imagine people might like to use it because you could, if you shared that folder, you could then, you know, send your password or have that known through some other channel, get it to somebody um, and say, hey, I've, I just uploaded a file. I just encrypted it because this particular one we care about, you know the password. And then they could get it or you could, you know, take it and email it to them, whatever. Anyway, just sort of a cool service, but uh, missing a few important things for a service like this. I'm sure you saw the news, Leo, that uh, ISIS has now essentially made a death threat against Twitter founder Jack Dorsey. Hmm. Um uh, they, uh, uh, in an online post, which has since been removed uh, on uh, the Just Paste It site, they said, your virtual war on us will cause a real war on you. And then they had a doctored photo of Jack with gun sights Ugh. centered on his face. Yeah. They're unhappy. Uh, that is, ISIS is unhappy. Uh, I I I ISIS are, is apparently behind this because Twitter is being socially responsible and taking down uh, the terrorist Twitter accounts as quickly as they find them. And I guess Twitter has hundreds of people who, whose full-time job is responding to reports of this and verifying them and then taking fraudulent accounts down. And it's just sort of, it just sort of a, a, a sad wake-up call that that's, you know, on, on one hand, it demonstrates, I guess, that the Internet is as real as everything else in the world today, but it's also unfortunate. That, also, uh, it demonstrates how media-savvy ISIS is. Um, yes. Cause, and that's really the, the real story here is that they have, unlike other terrorist groups, figured out they, exactly how to play the game. Yeah, well, they have camera crews and, yeah. and lighting consultants. Yeah. and <laughs> yeah. It's just like, oh, Lord. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, now, this is interesting. This is not a security story, but we talk a lot about DNS. And I thought this was really just curious. And that is the news that Google has just paid $25 million for the entire dot app hmm. top level domain. So that's a valuable domain if you think about star, it. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Star.app. Yeah. yeah. And. And um, all you and have then, to do is search for all the apps whose domain name is somethingapp.com to realize how valuable that is. Almost right. every app on iOS and Android has a website that is somethingapp.com. So um, and then it turns out this is not that new because um, Amazon last year paid five million for dot buy. Oh. And also 2.2 .2 million for dot spot. Huh. And, and but at that, uh, until Google's 25 million uh, purchase, and these are auctions, by the way. So uh, Google outbid everybody else who wanted star dot app, essentially. Who gets the, the money company, from that? Uh, that goes to ICANN to support, you know, the, all of the things they're that doing they're good. doing. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, and then Dot Tech, a company called Dot Tech, paid six point seven million for Dot Tech. T E C H. We should mention that this I can created this policy uh, a few, maybe a year ago, something like that, where you could uh, register a, a TLD, you know, any arbitrary TLD, and if you had sufficient 
I don't know what funds, I guess you could own it. Well, and yeah, and so this is what this is what I want to talk about because, for example, Amazon has applied for a total of seventy six. Wow. They're they're, they're they're called GTLDs, generic top level domains, and Google has applied for a total of one hundred and one. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, Google also wants dot blog, mm -hmm. and they want dot cloud and dot search. Wow. And so here's two interesting tidbits from Google's application to ICANN. For dot .blog, they said, our application for the dot .blog TLD describes a new way of automatically linking new second-level domains to blogs on our blogger platform. This approach eliminates the need for any technical configuration on the part of the user and thus makes the domain name more user-friendly. Okay, so, and I'll just read the second one, then we'll talk about this. For They also want .dev. So for .dev, they said, second-level domain names within the .dev proposed GTLD are intended for registration and use by Google only. And domain names under the new .dev GTLD will not be available to the general public for purchase, sale, or registration. As such, Google intends to apply for an exemption to the ICANN Registry Operator Code of Conduct, as Google is intended to be the sole registrar and registrant. Now, this represents a complete change in the way the inter as demonstrated by the fact that Google is going to need an exemption to the ICAM policies because Google is saying now traditionally what would have been done is it would have been you know dev.google.com but Google has a lot of money and ICAM has said we'll sell global top level domains so Google says, ah, good, we want .dev just for ourselves. We're going we're gonna to use it internally. .dev will never be available for anyone else. That's Google internal um, top-level domain name. And they're saying this similarly about .blog. We want to, we're, we're going we're gonna to buy, we're going to outbid anybody else for .blog and and then use our blogging platform to automatically hook blog um, you know blogs to the dot blog TLD. So for example, you know I have a, a WordPress blog, uh, blog.grc.com and and so and I got my DNS set up so that blog.grc.com redirects to the the IP address at WordPress so people can get to the, the blog.grc.com with that domain name, but actually goes to WordPress. And so what Google is saying is, eh, we're, we're, we, we're, we just like to buy blog, please. And then it'll be, you know, steve.blog will be the, the name for this. So anyway, I just thought it was interesting. I mean, it, as you said, Leo, it's generating a lot of money. It's also taking potentially powerful global, um, you know, top-level domains off the market forever. Now, I don't know that's a bad thing. They've never been on the market before. And the argue, the counter-argument is, will anything ever really replace .com? You know, that's – consumers are so invested in .com being, you know, where you go – that, you know, that's that's always the domain you want. And I know when I see things that are like .net or .org, I think, wow, I hope people remember that, you know, right. that's it's a different if it, it's it's a different suffix on the end of that name. Yeah. No, I, I think uh, we've seen this before. Remember when uh, sex.com sold for some ungodly amount of money and was never really and worth anything. And XXX, triple yeah. X, I think, yeah. also did. Well, because uh, everybody thought, oh, the generic... You know, TV.com went for a lot of money because the generic .com name is going to be somehow hugely valuable. And then I think what happened is nobody really, who enters in .anything? 
When you yeah. want to go to a site, if I want to go to GRC, I'll just type GRC into Google and it'll bring me there. <laughs> so exactly. I don't even know if that how relevant that all is anyway anymore. Yeah. I agreed. And in fact, that takes us perfectly into the second story because Google has also announced a, a, a Skunk Works project that is apparently not yet public. Well, I mean, I know it's not public, but it, it is private. And that is that they have they have been building something for some length of time called a knowledge vault. And uh, the, the, the new scientist has a story explaining that apparently all the big companies we know about, um, Apple and Microsoft and Google and, you know, like the, 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 the main big movers on the Internet, they're all doing this. We've seen this, this ridiculous falling cost in the, the cost of storage and the ability now to send bots out and suck in the whole internet, uh, which of course is the way Google's index works. They've announced something called KBT, knowledge-based trust. There's a, an interesting paper, a, a white paper that I've linked to in the show notes, exp which is full of summation symbols and differential calculus. And I mean, it is really toe curling ac academic stuff but what what they're proposing to do in the same way we've talked about before for example um the way you know the the the, the, the famousness of google the thing they did that immediately took us all away from alta vista that were that we were using at the time is to rate a site based on the quality and count of links linking to that site that was a, a simple means for them to get a, a, a metric on the quality of a given page on a site. Now Google is claiming that they've noticed that the Internet is full of m misstated untruths and fallacies. And they're not wanting to rank as highly sites containing untruth as sites containing true things. And Google believes they have a way to mechanistically tell the difference, Wow, which is an amazing claim. Um, and so they're saying that, that they have this knowledge vault, which contains um, uh, 1.6 billion facts. The, this automated knowledge vault has 1.6 billion facts and of those 271 million are rated as confident facts um, and and that means that Google's model ascribes a more than 90 percent chance of that being true um, and apparently it's it builds this huge cross-reference fact base knowledge base s structure and in the same way that Google said a while ago, and we've talked about it recently, that they're going to add whether sites are using security or not as an additional hint to the ranking engine in Google searches. They're saying, this is the, what they're, they're proposing to do, that they're going to start affecting ranking results based on this knowledge vault's determination of the factualness, the truthfulness of individual sites. <laughs> the world is changing. Well, and it also raises some issues. I mean... It does, not it? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, facts is facts, but uh, maybe know. not agreement on whether something's a fact or not. I Really? It, now, now it, it's interesting because... It used to be that you you uprate you uprated yourself if you were you know a CEO uh, I mean sorry an SEO crazed person I've never just bothered I just figured the only way to do SEO right is just have a site with high quality content and don't worry about it but of course that's not why you have a, an SEO department whose whole goal is to is to give you a high search order ranking. Um, but but traditionally, you know, 
it was it was arranged to get inbound links and make your server run fast because we've all also heard, for example, that Google is going to tend to increase the ranking of sites that are served faster because they want to encourage that and they think that maybe that the the speed of the server is connected to the quality of the site. I mean, they're 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 looking for signals as they call them, and so I agree with you, Leo. The notion of of Google, who I mean, Google is now a verb. You you don't you don't go to a search engine to look something up. You Google it, and you know Google is our portal. It's the way we view the internet. Anything I want to find out, I you Google is my search engine. I put the term in. I put a sentence in. I just, sometimes I ask it a question, and there's my you know like there's my answers right there. So it's incredibly valuable, and now. They're adding this new twist, which is eh, we're going to uh, try to downgrade the sites that are, uh, you know, BS. Some stuff is is verifiably factual, but there are people who say we didn't land on the moon, and I don't think they're. I don't think we're going to be hearing from them anytime well, soon. Well, but I, I, I mean, I don't know. Disappear. They, I'm sure they believe that what they're saying is factual. Who is it? Is it uh, is it up to Google to decide that? And and exactly, isn't that interesting? Because you know the other you know the, the other controversial thing is that that has been reported is that when I pull up a Google search, and for example, when Jenny pulls one up, we get different results. Right, you're because you're logged in. Go yeah. Yes, we're logged in, and we have relationships with Google, right. and Google knows something about us and tries to give us the results we want. But the problem is that tends to increase the fragmentation of sort of the community because it, it, it's sort of like a, a self a self fulfilling prophecy or or, or self self reinforcing right. selection yeah i mean yeah. what if they had done this uh, in the time of uh uh galileo and uh well everybody knows that the Earth, the yep. sun revolves around the earth uh yeah yeah that's a fact isn't it epicycles epicycles yeah, yeah. So that's a fact. So facts. Yeah, who is this weird guy? Good thing we that he doesn't show Can't up. Can't find the him in the Google search. <laughs> oh. I think that is a typical engineering point of view that there are facts. Boy, and if you look at this paper though, it'll cro your eyes will. I did. I did. I looked at it's the math. Just, oh, Holy cow! Woo, baby. Yeah. So they and 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 all. I will say independently, the concept of an automated knowledge vault is intriguing. I mean, we saw what IBM's Watson could do on Jeopardy. It's like, okay, I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm giving up and going home. Thanks anyway. <laughs> that it was just shocking yeah. to see what it could do. And so, I think we're we're with processor power becoming what it is and storage becoming as big as it is, there's something, you know, we may still not know how the human brain works, but we may know how to model knowledge and regurgitate it. Uh, and, you know, see how it referentially links to itself. Wow. So, Spock. Yes. Um, uh, I'm sure everyone who is uh, listening to the podcast knows that Leonard Nimoy died last week. Uh, 83 years old, uh, COPD, and I think he was not misquoted as saying that he wished he hadn't smoked as much as he did. I think he gave it up, uh, as I recall, but he spent a lot of time smoking. And uh, so he was in the hospital at the time and had been battling uh, COPD for some time. So it didn't come as a surprise to people that were close to him. And I heard you guys talking about it on Twit. There was a question about whether Shatner was going to be able to be there. And first it was thought that he wouldn't be, but then I heard later that he was able to get on a plane and, and make it to the memorial. I guess so, so yeah, yeah. He had a, a charity and of course, event that he had to go to, but I think he managed yeah. to work it out. Yeah. And everyone knows that I've always been uh, very much of the, you know, uh, the, <laughs> the 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 Star Trek generation. Uh, I you can tell really, because those of us in the Star Trek generation practiced so that we could get our fingers to do that. I can only do it on one hand, but <laughs> yeah. And and actually, it doesn't come naturally. Man, I don't think. The best, the best man at my wedding was unable to do that. Oh, and dear. I begged Gary. I said, because Gary had a really a, a dark sense of humor. And I said, okay, now, you know, you're going to be asked to say something. 
please don't embarrass me, please. You know, I mean, because Lord knows what he could say. And so he honored my wish. He he and he got up with the microphone. He said, Steve asked me not to embarrass him, so I'm not going to. And he held up his hand and he had two rubber bands. Oh, how funny. Uh, around each pair of fingers because he wasn't able to do the live long and prosper sign oh, that's uh, without a little bit of help. Yeah. But I did hear during the, the news coverage of this, some people got the story wrong about why Star Trek only had three seasons. Um, they, they were complaining that, uh, that it was, I think it was on the wrong time. The, the person that the, I saw talking about it, I think it was George Takai, actually, because uh, uh, he was interviewed on one of the shows, um, said that it was on uh, like 10 o'clock on a Friday night. Oh, and that's terrible. That, yeah, yeah, because, I mean, you know, no one's watching TV then. Yeah, right. Um, but I had an occasion. I, I was at Comdex one year, and that's the year that I bumped into Stu Alsop, who was at the time the, uh, the editor-in-chief of InfoWorld, and he and I set up the deal for me to do the column, uh, which I initially was called Behind the Screens, but, it, but there was a collision with um, CompuServe. They had a trademark on that. So then he said, Steve, we can't call it Behind the Screens, so I renamed it Tech Talk which, of course, was the column that I did for eight years every week in InfoWorld. While we were, we, were, we were at a bar hanging out, having a couple beers, and he said, hey, what, you know, do you have any dinner plans? And I said, no. He said, well, I've, you know, I'm, you know, I've, I've got to, I'm going to meet some people, and we're going to go to dinner. Why don't you tag along? I said, I'd be glad to. So I went upstairs in the Las Vegas Hilton and uh, knock on this random door and – Someone opens it, and there's, you know, some geeky-looking kind of heavy-set guys just sort of lounging around, apparently waiting for Stu. So we walk in, and they introduce themselves. And I don't remember anybody else's name in the room because one of the people there said, I'm Gene Roddenberry. Wow. And at that point, it was like, oh, my God. <laughs> now, conversation you know, I'm ended. Now, <laughs> I'm not going to start drooling and be the crazy born again, you know, fanboy, everything. But I did arrange to sit next to Gene at dinner. <laughs> and so I just said to him, you know, I'm a fan. So I, I love sci-fi. Um, what you did with Star Trek was, you know, was, I said, in fact, I did tell him, I think that my, my buddies and I made a Star Trek movie. And I've talked about that on the podcast where we scratched the emulsion in order to make phaser beams and, and had, had arranged to have people stand under a chandelier and beam out and all that. I mean, seriously, geeky stuff. Oh, and I talked about how we made the audio track because we the uh, Scott Wilson's sister had stuffed bunny rabbits, and so the aliens were the bun-ons. And uh, <laughs> we... So, the bun-ons. So and, 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 and we used still frame uh, 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 camera in order to march them down the hallway and, <laughs> and attack us and we so are, forth. Anyway. Yes. Yeah. And, and that was where... Yeah, Snotty Banani Peshoy, uh, Yosha Bedidro, Snotty Banani Peshoy Yerneros came from. Uh -huh. Because if you reverse that, it comes out, we yard the Banans, surrender your ship or be destroyed. <laughs> so, yeah, oh yes. Anyway, I, so I said to Gene, what happened? We only got three years. And he said, oh, there's an interesting story there that he oh. says not many people know. Oh. And he said, this was before the time that Nielsen was doing demographics. Nielsen was in the ratings business, and they were just counting heads. Yeah. They weren't counting whose heads. But they were, they were collecting the data. They just weren't using it. So based on the numbers compared to other shows that Star Trek was up against during the original Kirk and Nimoy and Shatner and, you know, Spock years, Star Trek really didn't do that well compared to the, the in just in terms of raw numbers. Years later, Nielsen introduced demographics where they, they realized it was important to care who was watching because five-year-olds weren't buying anything. Mm -hmm. Neither were 70-year-olds. Mm -hmm. But... Yuppies in their 20s and 30s and 40s were buying cars and baby formula and homes. And it turned out that 
in the process of developing and tuning the Nielsen demographics, they reprocessed all of the data they had collected in the past just because they had a database of it, to, you know, in order to design their model. Never in the history of television had there been a show that more exactly, perfectly targeted the demographic that advertisers wanted than Star Trek. And no one knew it then. Mm. And had they known it, it'd probably still be going today because it was exactly the audience that that advertisers wanted. And I just said, wow, that's a cool story. And that's straight from Gene himself. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's obvious yeah. in hindsight that the show was immensely influential. Oh, look at the legs it's had. It's changed yeah. our culture. I mean, we have things like phaser beams and tractor beams mm -hmm. and, and beam me up, Scotty. All of that came from there. I mean, none of that exists. We're amazingly creative little monkeys. <laughs> um, okay, so you said you would see it last week. I know that you've seen it since last week. Our listeners haven't had your corroboration of my opinion of Citizen Four. Oh, it was really good. It was surprising because I put it off because I thought, I know the story and it's going to be kind of grim and it's just going to be slow and I don't really need to spend two hours watching this. But, you know, Laura Poitras did a really good job of yep. uh, adding drama. And as you said last week, it's really interesting that she had the cameras oh. right from the beginning. In fact, I, Lisa and I were watching it. Lisa loved it too. And uh, I said, oh, he's got the shirt on. He's about to do the interview that was the first, <laughs> you know, I recognize the shirt. And so, right. and that was like half an hour in. So you right. really got a, a sense of, and and it was, I was staring at uh, Edward Snowden the whole time because you could, he didn't, it, outwardly it wasn't really obvious that he was um, nervous, but he it was so clear that the guy was just really scared of what was about to happen. Uh, yeah. And knew that the, the, uh, that the NSA would not be happy and I feel like he was waiting for somebody to break down the door at any moment. It was a really the tension. Oh, well, you saw him twitchy. The, the, he was the, very the twitchy. Alarm went off, the alarm went off yeah. in the hotel. Wasn't that a moment? Mm. And they're like, "Oh my God!" You know, and like and he someone knocked the door. Over his head. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Wow. I, yeah. Anyway, I, I, so I wanted to make sure there. There was a. Um, it, it appeared briefly on uh, the, uh, the Huffington Post published an article. I guess it was yesterday with a link to the show, which I presumed was legitimate because it was the Huffington Post, you know, not some, you know, you know, uh, paste it dot com or something. Uh, it turned out it was not legitimate. I got a tweet back from because because I said, hey, you know, here's a copy of Citizen Four. Anyone who wants it, um, it is on. You said, oh, it, it, yeah, it is on iTunes and HBO, HBO Go. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to. I want your confirmation of my opinion because, as I said, I I loved it and and I came out of there feeling something I really with an appreciation I didn't have before, which was that even though, and I know you are of the same feeling, even though we're we are not crazy concerned about privacy, I I came away with a deeper respect for the rights of those who are. That is that you know. Privacy is a right. If yeah. if you know, and 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 or if that's how we're going to define it, then we ought to honor that definition rather than say it's a right and then not have it treated like one. It was also fun to see Lagar Levinson in it and uh, Jacob Applebaum. Although Applebaum, I think, has posted uh, not exactly a rebuttal, but a but um, a, uh, you know, and I didn't get a chance to watch it, so I shouldn't speak. But somebody sent me a link. That's the the subhead was something like misrepresentations are justified uh, for the greater good. I got the impression that Applebaum might have thought that he was a little bit misrepresented in there, but in any event, um, must must watch. And if I can find the uh, the video, maybe the chat room can uh, pass it along. Um, just fascinating, and of course. We haven't seen the end of it. I mean, I don't know how much more material there is, but every week there's something new. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. And here we are 18 months in. Okay, so two more things. I know also that you have also fallen in love with a previous show recommendation of mine. I once explained that, you know, I normally like 
shows involving titanium endoskeletons with, you know, plasma-driven robots and such. And so when somebody was recommending The Good Wife to me, that was about as far off, as a title off of, my, of my, like, what kind of stuff me would, would appeal yep. to me. But it is fabulous. And I know you've discovered it, and you've been running forward through it. So Yeah, yeah I'm uh, really, Lisa and I are really enjoying it, yeah. Yeah, and so to that I wanted to add one more show, which is really coming on well. It's in its third season, so for those who like to binge, there's plenty there, and that's on FX, The Americans. Are you watching it? Oh, yeah, I've seen a couple of seasons of it, yeah. Okay, Yeah. Uh, because for those of our listeners who haven't been, uh, it tells a really interesting story of some embedded Russian spies in Washington, D.C., uh, back in the Reagan era, so it's set back in time, you know, Cold War, and just anyway, uh, I, 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 it's I'm loving it. So I wanted to put that out there as another recommendation for me of uh, of you know not not technical shows, but just really good television. Yes, I agree. And today, voting opens for the podcast awards. <laughs> It, it, I don't know why the page says, vote today, vote tomorrow, vote often. Well, there maybe you go. That explains they, a lot. <laughs> maybe they want you to come back for advertising impressions. I don't know. I would love you to come back to vote for security now. So it's podcastawards.com. Um, I'm down at the very bottom uh, in the technology. The, the, the first item in the technology section is security now. Uh, I would love to win this year. I, I just we haven't won for a number of years. I think it would be fun. So uh, I just like to see if our audience has the power to make that happen. I imagine that they do. Um, okay, and this is totally crazy, but apparently authentic. Um, some Cornell University researchers were wondering about epidemic outbreaks, and so they decided to model. Uh, what would happen if zombies were real? So this is the zombie outbreak model. There's a beautiful animated, automated tool on GitHub. I've got the link to it in the show notes. Uh, and Vox.com has the, the original link about the uh, zombie apocalypse science. And this is legitimate mathematical modeling. And if you just want the short version you want to head to the Northern Rockies. That, it turns out, in the event of the zombie apocalypse, is where you want to be. Oh, uh, good but to if know. You're, if, but yeah, good to know. But if you're curious, uh, you might put in zombies-USA. I imagine that uh, into the universal Google search finder. Uh, that will probably take you to the GitHub page uh, that has that as its name, zombies-USA. And they, it's just beautiful. It's this, a map of the U.S., with uh, bright spots showing population centers, and you can see what happens uh, if the zombies uh, decide to get restless. And lastly, uh, this is this I've been waiting on. I've been sitting on this since February 24th. I just waiting for its turn. I got the biggest kick out of it because this was a Francisco Gomez who wrote to Sue, who forwarded it to, to me on Tuesday, February 24th. The subject was, oh my God. You guys are incredible, slash, spin right. And he said, I could write, this is not long. So he said, I could write a long, with a bunch of O's, email telling you how great you are. But after 12 hours of other people spent fighting and failing to get the data restored, you guys made me look like a hero in front of my wife. Her IT department said she had lost all of her data. But after using SpinWrite and running CheckDisk, I was able to extract all of the data, even when the hard disk drive was encrypted. You guys are geniuses sent from my iPhone. So thank you. That's why the email wasn't very long, because he was typing it on his touch screen. Anyway, thank you, Francisco. I appreciate that. All right. We've been waiting for this for a long time, Steve. I'm very excited. Uh, you mentioned this last week that you would have... Uh, these guys on the show, and um, we even showed the video. Was it Andrea Mitchell who had plowed into those cones? No, it was uh, 
uh, Leslie Stahl. Leslie Stahl, who, that's right. Who on, yeah. he was on 60 Minutes a couple of weeks ago, one of their segments was talking about the problem with the the current lack of, of real security in automobiles. And I, I was just, I was floored by the idea that there was no longer a reliable connection between the brake pedal that the driver controls and the braking of the vehicle, which the pedal is supposed to, to, to enact, essentially. I mean, the idea, I mean, it's one thing to say, oh, you know, we've got software because we want to have USB and, and play our iPhones through our, our cars, and we want OnStar, and we want to be able to approach the car and have the doors magically unlock, and, you know, all these fancy things. Oh, and I'd like to have, you know, the car know whose key is using it so that it automatically adjusts the seats so that it's, you know, it remembers the, the preferences of the current driver. All of that is cool stuff. But I don't, in the process, want to sacrifice the fundamental imperatives of the way the car works. That is, you know, that the thing you need is when you press on the brakes, you stop. And of course, we know what was about a year ago that Toyota went through the acceleration problems. We never really got a straight answer about right. that. There was some nonsense about, oh, the carpet was getting <laughs> tangled up you that know, was their story. In, in the accelerator <laughs> yeah. pedal. Yeah. Okay. You know, and then a couple of years ago, we covered on this podcast the UCSD researchers who were working with, uh, I think, University of Washington. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of the first, the, the first surfacing of our of our sort of this low-level concern that something was wrong with the way cars were being developed, that it just, like, you know, and it's not surprising either because this is what we see time and time again is, is a system which is not computerized then begins to get computers, but the focus is on making it work, and only after the fact, sometimes after a great deal of pain, is making it secure. So by, by gr happy coincidence, I was going through the Security Now mailbag a couple of weeks ago, and I ran, I ran across a note from one of the guys at Galois, which is the WW, or not WWW, but GALOIS.com, who were the people who were shown on the 60 Minutes report who are... Uh, recipients of funding from DARPA because just in the same way that the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency was the originator of the internet, now DARPA has something called uh, uh, HACOMS, sort of an awkward acronym, but the best <laughs> way to pronounce it is HACOMS, where they're funding various organizations, whether whether commercial en entities or educational or research or, or governmental, whatever. They don't really care who they're giving money to, but they've pulled together a project whose goal is to tackle the challenge of truly securing our cars. And so uh, for this week's podcast, uh, thanks to their interest, I mean, their, their Security Now listeners, uh, at least some of them, uh, we have the guys who have successfully hacked not only cars but UAVs to talk to us about, you know, the nature of the vulnerabilities, how acute the vulnerabilities are, and their focus has been on working with DARPA and the other, the other team members on re coming up with ultimately and someday a true solution to this problem. Well, without further ado, let's say hello to Lee Pike and uh, Pat Hickey from Galois.com. Uh, Hi. Hi, Lee. Hi, Pat. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Good, good to have you. So what, what so, was the brand of car Leslie was uh, driving? No, 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 no. We can't. Yeah, we've been <laughs> so, 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 so he, That's he, all I want to know. <laughs> here's so I don't buy it. Is all cars have this problem. Yeah. Um, and, and they increasingly have this problem. Uh, there are somewhere uh, as many as 50 so-called ECUs, you know, it, sort of autonomous uh, subassembly computer units in a high-end car. And even economy cars will have maybe half that, you know, in the low 20s. And so, so the reason the make and model wasn't shown 
was, first of all, they don't want to really upset anyone. And it's really not fair to, to discriminate because all cars today are like this. Well, wait a minute. All cars are like this? I mean, take it, take it away, guys. You can hack my car? <laughs> uh, probably not in specific. What we've been part of is, you know, security researchers have found vulnerabilities. Uh, we reproduced some of those um, to help the 60 Minutes folks demonstrate that so each TV. model would have a different exploit that's right. uh yeah or but makes might have some components that are common across several model years and, and many are going to be shared because it's all coming from the same suppliers uh the subcomponents right what is it what is the typical avenue of exploitation well, so, so uh, it depends. I mean, there's two kind of classes. So one class of exploits is if you have physical access to the car, and this makes it much easier because you can basically uh, hook right into the data bus. Yeah, we've and, always said that. If somebody has your computer, you're, you're, right. you're pretty much screwed. That's right. Yeah. Well, it's even easier than that because if they have your computer and you've got an encrypted hard drive, it's password protected, uh, it, you know, there's a little, some challenge to get into your uh, <laughs> car. There's no such challenge to get into an automobile. Interesting. And CAN bus is the bus of, on most of these? That's right. Yeah. yeah. yeah we use CAN and, bus and for our audio. Can you hack my audio? <laughs> 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 one of the one, one of the problems that you, you could sort of divide attacks into two categories. There's there's like a, a targeted attack where someone specifically wants to attack someone else. Like you know, uh, the the uh, Putin is unhappy with one of his adversaries, for example, and decides to, to to go after them. And then the other would be sort of opportunistic attacks. More, you know, and and we see both classes of those attacks on the internet. And it turns out that the same sort of the same sort of models apply here. For example, the diagnostic computers in car dealerships are also connected to the internet. And so when that computer connects to your car. That's a standardized interface, and it's a means for the diagnostic computer to access the networks in the car. And all of those little ECUs are firmware reprogrammable, meaning that they can be attacked. That's right. Yeah, and furthermore, you know, you can, um, you know, with a computer, you need to actually grab it. If you want to reprogram it, put a new program on it, you need to have access. But you know, for convenience, um, you don't want to have to pull out every a small ECU in the vehicle. So you can do this all over the over the bus, which makes it uh, even more problematic. For, for example, in, in one example of, of an attack, a malicious CD was put into the CD player on a car. And believe it or not, cars have buffer overrun problems, just mm -hmm. like we do in all of our regular software today. Yeah, yeah. I guess fact, the real concern, though, mostly is what happened to Leslie Stahl, where she was hacked remotely. I mean, if somebody's got access to my car, I'm going to presume they can do stuff to it. But, <laughs> but the real scare is that I could be driving by somebody. How hard is that to do? So uh, pretty much all modern cars, the high-end ones, will have a telematics unit, which is a cell phone modem, you know, 2G right. or a 3G modem. Um, and the, uh, the, the attack that was demonstrated in the uh, University of Washington uh, UCSD paper was that you could call that cell phone number. Uh, there was an in-band modem that had a buffer overflow. So um, if you played all the right tones to it, uh, you could <laughs> reprogram its firmware. An audio and hack. I like bus, that. Right? <laughs> uh, the telematics unit is your gateway into the system. It's just as if you had physical access at that point. Wow. So all the other attacks then can be executed. Wow. Yeah, so so basically you have a car connected to its own cell phone yeah. and the, it's got problems in the software that uh, that can be overrun. It's not uh it's going to be pretty targeted is 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 that right? I mean, uh, it's not going to be something that somebody could just say, "Oh, I see a car over there." Or is it? Well, I mean, once you once you find the vulnerability, um, it's it's not going to be uh, automobile specific. So, you know, just like you know, a computer virus or worm, right? Once it finds a particular vulnerability in an operating system, any any car with that telematic system is going to be vulnerable. Right. All right. And I, uh, the other strategy that these attackers showed was that. Um, the telematics units tend to all be in like specific phone number blocks. That's right. So the search space to find ah. 
oh, I know there's a car of this make and model parked in this parking lot. Let's just sit here for a couple of hours until we guess the right phone number. So it's doable. It's not trivial, but it, it can work. So probably the way to think of it is a little bit the way we think now of of Windows and Mac and Linux. Those three different operating systems all have vulnerabilities, but the same virus cannot attack all three of them. You That's need right. an OS-specific virus. That's right, yeah. yeah. And, and um, you know, in addition, like I was mentioning earlier, you've got, you know, uh, uh, even in different makes and different models, the same uh, suppliers oftentimes delivering that software to uh, multiple different vehicles. So it could be a completely different uh, vehicle and vulnerable to the same attack. Right. It's and this isn't something that typically, like, consumers or even the car manufacturers themselves care that much about. Um, they're just buying an off-the-shelf part. Well, they will. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I, I hope. Uh, are there are there attacks in the wild already? I mean, have you, or is this all theoretic? There's none that we know of. Um, yeah. uh, other than, um, you know, uh, key fob entry into vehicles. Yeah, right. Uh, that's been reported in the media. Yeah. But, so right. they tend to focus on the most profitable attacks first. So Steal the uh, car, in other words. Yeah. That's right. Others in the media have shown you can go on the black market Ebays, essentially, and yeah. find a kit that does the keyless entry, some kind of buffer overflow or who knows what with the keyless entry. Well, and the attacks that. you're talking about really would be more malicious or even, you know, I mean, uh, murderous Yeah, but attacks. it also could be used for this exact same to steal kind a car. of car theft thing. It's yeah. probably just that there are lower hanging fruit at the moment. Right. I guess, too, that um, if you have a, a, a given piece of hardware that can unlock the doors only of a certain make and model, that's fine. You just walk around the city looking for that particular right. car, and those are the ones you steal. <laughs> and, or, and, or you have the hack for the cars you want the most. Right. I mean, we, yeah. we know the car thieves are looking for specific models. Generally. I think it's, it's important to remember, too, it's not just about people wanting to steal vehicles, but, you know, as cars become more connected, you have your personal information on them, people might want to track you, governments might want to track you, uh, you're vulnerable to these, uh, you know, invasions of privacy, uh, vulnerable to having your personal information stolen through the vehicle. Right. Uh, another attack that was demonstrated by those same researchers is using the uh, microphone, that's for the uh, phone calls or other uh, functions, um, to listen to whoever's in the car without them ever knowing it. I think that one was demonstrated on 60 Minutes Well, as well. mostly they're just yes. going to hear me singing and <laughs> and, and swearing well, a little bit as people go and by. And I guess, I guess then we're, uh, unfortunately, for the last year and a half, we've been talking about the, the consequences of well-financed nation states interest. And this does, unfortunately, sound like the sort of thing that you know, are the the high end law enforcement uh, organizations might task a division to go develop these capabilities for as broad a spectrum and broad a class of vehicles as possible, so that they have them available to them when they need them. We're talking to Lee Pike and Pat Hickey. They're with Galois.com, uh, and they uh, were well. Their technologies were featured on a sixty minutes piece with Leslie Stahl showing. Uh, how easy it was to hack an unknown America. Is it mostly American cars? European cars have the same problem? Japanese cars? They all... Yeah, all of them. It's all the same. There's no advantage. Yeah, I mean, we've heard either anecdotally or in published work from every single make and model that you can think of. If you get a F-150 from 1970, it might not be vulnerable. <laughs> the dumber the car, the better. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, aren't auto... But auto, I presume auto manufacturers are aware of this, but as I mentioned, their timeline for updating models is a lot slower than, uh, you know, computers. Um, That's right. What are they right. doing to, to mitigate these problems? Um, and uh, the other thing we found is that car manufacturers are very cost sensitive. So if you have to add a TPM-like device, a trusted platform module, uh, which is used to secure some computer boot chains, um, if you had to add one of those to every ECU, it would increase the final sales value of the car by like thousands of dollars. Right. Right. So the heavyweight solutions we're used to uh, won't apply in this field, uh, unfortunately. I remember talking uh, to the folks at Ford and they, um they said one solution would be to have two computers, have the telematics computer separate from the computer that runs the car. Uh, is anybody doing that? Right. That's, a, that's a, certainly uh, a costly solution. 
I, I mean, that's actually the case now. There are separate computers for all these separate tasks. The problem is that they're all on a completely unprotected network. Uh, that network has no um, authentication or access control. So the telematics computer, once it's been reprogrammed through a buffer overflow somewhere, uh, can start acting like it's the brake pedal uh, sensor. And and it's you know there's also a uh, sometimes safety and security are in tension with each other. So you might think, oh, let me completely separate the cabin from any of the uh, engine control. But uh, if you're in say an accident and you've got sensors that detect a crash in your engine or near in the front of the car, you might want to 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 tell the cabin you know unlock all the doors so you can right, get out. Right. So it's not al always obvious um, that you can make these security. Uh, Constraints. Right. It, it can be difficult to completely isolate components. Um, and right now, there's not very many good mechanisms for doing fine grain compartmentalization, right. which is generally part of every security story is, you know, the, the, the principle of uh, least, privilege. least privilege. Right. Well, share, so sharing, sharing a bus is inevitable because they have to talk to each other. Right. But, but you need to have some procedures in place to... It's and one one thing that's problematic is you know in particular you've mentioned the CAN bus already and it's it's a broadcast bus you know there's no uh, time division and and it's got a very small um, payload size so it's really incompatible it wasn't designed for uh, having any kind of security so it's right. it's very difficult with and that's not going to go away anytime soon um, there's too much infrastructure around it it's a cheap bus people know how it works right I mean there are upcoming buses that will allow uh, like upgrades to CAN that allow higher bit rates. So you can actually start adding signatures on every packet. Uh, whereas right now there's only an eight byte payload. So oh wow! You know, even if you only if you gave up just one byte for a signature, well then it'd be easy to guess, right? Yeah. And you'd have given up a quarter or an eighth of your space. Well, I didn't realize it was uh, so unsophisticated. This ain't Ethernet we're talking here. Um, <laughs> this is the finest field bus 1980 mm -hmm. could design. So, so okay, your guys' focus has been on fixing this. So That's talk to us a little bit about the notion of provably secure systems. And we ought to also mention that you're, you have also been spending time on the whole UAV issue. Right. And we were talking before the show that, of course, oh, yeah, no one's ever hacked a UAV. They're completely secure. <laughs> Yeah, so um, our specialization at Galois in general is um, a branch of software engineering called formal methods. And the idea is um, rather than giving you incomplete evidence about the correctness of a system that you get through testing, uh, uh, the realization is that software fundamentally is a mathematical um, uh, system and we can prove properties about this. So rather than just trying to test and, and you know, always missing bugs, let, let me give you a piece of software where I've proved the correctness once and for all that no matter what inputs it, it gets, it, it computes the right, uh, right values. And so using these techniques, you know, we've de uh, developed and we've been applying these to the embedded system world in particular for this program so that uh, the kinds of things that we've talked about here um, just aren't possible. So things like buffer overflows. That's interesting that you could prove correctness. Um, That's right. This this isn't a, a new idea. So this has been around, um, you know, for well, nearly since the beginning of computer science. But so one of the things that uh, makes it possible today is that uh, because of the power of computers, before you had to do these proofs by hand. So literally, you know, you're a mathematician. You're, you're sitting down with a pencil, pencil and a piece of paper, and you know, this works for a ten-line program. Um, but it doesn't scale to a hundred line or a thousand line or million line program, especially if it's concurrent. But with uh, the more power, uh, powerful processing, with better algorithms, uh, we can actually have the computers do the proofs for us. So, and uh, these are not brute force kind of testing every possibility. This no. is this is actually mathematical proof. That's right. Wow. Right. That's, right. that's so impressive. Like, wow. You could, Algorithmic theorem proving yeah, sort of that's amazing. process. That's yeah. right. And and this has been, you know, taken up in the hardware industry. So, uh, um, you know, for example, Intel, after the FDIV bug, uh, started uh, doing this in, in, um, in, in designing hardware. And there, uh, the, the payoff is obvious, right? So it's very hard to patch. Well, you can't really patch hardware. So they have to get it correct. 
um, you know, part of the problem is that in the software industry, we've had this kind of sense that, oh, you know, um, software, we can always uh, fix it after the fact, or it's, you know, how hard software to write. And so um, we just haven't been applying these same approaches. And I, and I think, again, the, the, where the industry is, is what we've seen, as, as I mentioned, we're seeing it now with the Internet of Things. People are finally beginning to, you know, p people jumped on the concept of having their refrigerator on the Internet so they could talk to it at work mm -hmm. for some reason. Um, that was all good, but immediately those Internet of Things things started getting hacked. And really... As soon as you have telematic systems where cars have cell phones and they're able to, to you know, use use technology to call 911 if the car uh, has the problem or, you know, the OnStar system or you need to ask to get your car unlocked because you locked your keys in somehow, all of that stuff. Now our vehicles, our cars are Internet of Things <laughs> vehicles that unfortunately, you know, move at very high speed and and <laughs> carry our bodies around in them. Yeah, I yeah. kind of want to make sure that's reliable. <laughs> it's yeah, not so like a rocket to the moon, but hey, you know. Right. So you know, uh, the in in the uh, academic world, people call these things you know cyber physical systems. So the idea of you know we're having software intensive uh, computers meeting physical systems where they can kill you, they can um, uh, 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 destroy property. Right. Um, so this is, yeah, this is... Right. Non-material harms like privacy right. invasion as well. We're so. talking to Lee Pike, who is the research lead uh, at Galois for Cyber Physical Systems, and Pat Hickey, uh, his colleague. Uh, they are the ones who demonstrated on 60 Minutes hacking a car while Leslie Stahl was driving it. A very brave thing of her, as it turns out. Um, <laughs> Somebody in the chat room asked, are more modern vehicles like, let's say, Tesla less prone to this kind of thing? Or are they even more so because they're so reliant on electronics? Uh, yeah, the increased reliance on electronics is just a, um, right now there's uh, not the kind of culture where they focus on the safety first. They focus on the features first because that's what people buy, right? I can understand it from an economic. Oh, yeah, my Audi, my brand new Audi has lots of giz gizmos and gadgets in there. <laughs> right. That's not necessarily more secure. That's probably less so. Uh, right. Uh, in fact, most of those are like new attack surfaces, right? Like <laughs> Great. Every, every cell phone it supports connecting right. to is a fresh you right. know, stack to look for a buffer over from. Right, right. right. Uh, I know you don't want to speak specifically about any brand, uh, so we'll uh, table the conversation about Tesla. Uh, well, I'll and I, I, one question I have is, have you seen any evidence that there is any specific manufacturer who is extra good about this or are they all just so hampered by the CAN bus and the legacy uh, load that they're dragging forward that they're just more concerned about the shape of the exterior metal than they are the, right. the composition of the internal code? So, so I, I don't know if I want to speak about any, uh, any particular manufacturer, but I think there has been, um, there's the work has been uh, a wake-up call to the the industry in general, and there's uh, committees looking at improving the security of automobiles. People taking this more seriously, um, even on the safety side. For example, with the the Toyota case. Um, I, so uh, I'm uh, somewhat optimistic. Right. I, the real problem is that right now, you know, car manufacturers might leave out seatbelts if they weren't required to. <laughs> you could cynically say if they weren't incented to right. uh, by regulations. And there are no incentives um, from like any kind of regulators about cybersecurity yet. Uh, and that's something that uh, I can personally hope uh, will happen in the near future because I think we do need it. Well, and we've always seen trade-offs between security and convenience. As you talk about that all the time, Steve. Okay. Uh, right. And as somebody in the chat room is pointing out, buyers would probably rather see a car start up faster then have a slow check for authentication that that, that would be seen right. as a detriment even though it might keep them more safe there's a there's a presentation uh by the the gal who's been running the this darpa project the uh the hackums project uh and she referred to uh, so so she is in the middle of this she knows all about what they're doing she's she's you know participated in the r and d and she had an interesting observation to make, which was which essentially we saw 
on Leslie Stahl's face on 60 Minutes. And I, I imagine that this kind of publicity does more to incent manufacturers to say, you know, to, to, to try to be able to say our cars don't have this problem than anything else. But 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 Ka Kathleen, who is uh, with the Starper Project, explained that h how unnerving it was when she was driving a car and knew what was going to happen. She knew. I mean, she was you know in a in a in an area where it was safe. She wasn't actually going to run over anyone or damage the car. Um, that when the car was hacked and she hit the brakes and nothing happened. The, the, I mean, it was viscerally jarring because, you know, from the first moment we get behind the wheel when we're 16, every single time we press the brake pedal, the car slows down. And, you know, and you can imagine the panic. In fact, you know, we've seen it on Hollywood movies for years of, you know, and back then it's someone drains your brake lines uh, overnight and you go down and you live at the top of a steep winding road hill and now you're in trouble because you're pumping on the brakes and nothing is happening. But, you know, um, that's the sort of thing which, um, you know, hacking vehicles today means. I, I, I'm just stunned that that to that there and this is what surprised me was that the 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 electronics is in even the braking loop that that there isn't still like a fallback and i understand you know i guess uh regenerative braking is certainly one reason why you're actually not braking in, in a traditional fashion in in a hybrid vehicle you're wanting to capture that energy and put it back in the battery but on a on a on a car with disc brakes i, I would like to know that there's an actual an mechanical link. Yeah. A mechani yeah, mechanical well, link. I presume hand brakes are, but they're disappearing. Modern cars have electronics, bra electronic brakes. I don't have a hand That's brake in my point. car. Yeah. And, and, and Kathleen mentioned uh, on, on this video that the, the ECU, there's an ECU in charge of your seat belt tensioning. Can you imagine yes. if your car suddenly grabbed you? That, well, my car grabs me all the time. Oh, but uh, you mean for for other reasons? Yeah, uh, <laughs> unexpectedly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, well, this is a bad trend, really. The move towards uh, fly by wire, or as somebody in the chat room said, die by wire <laughs> vehicles. Well, it's. I mean, uh, so I think the the other side to play devil's advocate is that um, that you can have uh, um, more advanced you know, say braking or more advanced control. You can have a lighter, uh, cheaper system that you build, you know, because you don't have to put in hydraulics, you don't have to put in physical connections. And so, um, you know, to the to the end consumer, well, I've got a, right. a more advanced vehicle with more features that's cheaper and more fuel efficient, um, you know, that's, that's as good as it gets, except for right. the security aspect. I, I think, you know, there's a lot of smart automotive engineers that really know how to make good design trade-offs when they're building cars. Uh, but the design trade-off they don't have in their mind or maybe aren't weighing high enough right now is security. And that's something that I think is fixable. Um, and there's just, you know, many steps are going to be required to fix it. Uh, so, And, and we and need so to just decide. Go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lee. Oh, we, oh, we need to decide as a society, too, right, what the um, what the limits that we're willing to, to uh, what kind of... Uh, costs we're willing to incur for extra security, right? So, you know, we could have a perfectly secure, you know, basically everyone driving an Abrams tank, but no one wants to pay for that. You know, it's not fuel efficient. And so there's a trade-off. And, you know, in, in uh, commercial aviation, there's um, there's uh, legislation, right? It's, it's not up to the individual manufacturers to decide what that kind of reliability is. And, you know, we, we don't quite have that yet in the uh, commercial automotive world. So, I, yeah, I was going to say that I guess that I was wondering whether the best we could expect is pretty much to follow the, the, the same course we've seen with, with consumer computers, where, you know, finally, after a long time of email uh, scripting being enabled by default, that mm -hmm. finally got turned off because it was causing so much havoc. And then so, so incrementally, but really arguably very slowly, 
we we're moving forward and even today our you know we're still getting you know crypto wall is encrypting people's files and and you know we we've got spyware now in in the ads that we that we've been talking about we were talking about Commodia just last week and you know so so on one hand it would be sort of pessimistic to think but maybe realistic to think that we're going to have to go through the same process on the other hand it is, as you were just saying, Lee, the case that the that the automotive industry is subject to a great deal more functional regulation than somehow the PC software business has has ever been right. been put under. Maybe just because of history. Yeah. So, but but you know, legislation tends to just ignore. So you know, we we talk about boxes, right? Like you know, you deliver some sort of unit that may or may not have software in it, but the software is just treated like a black box. And, um, you know, you just assume that the software works correctly. And I think that kind of mindset we need to move away from. And so, you know, some, a lot of times the the automotive manufacturers who are integrating the systems, uh, they, are, they can't even see the software. It's proprietary. The suppliers provide it. Right. And so there's, there's no, you know, we just assume that it works correctly, but of course it's not the case. I think the the angle on how our work fits into that is, you know, right now I'm sure every one of those suppliers has a QA manager and that QA manager goes to the sales team and says, here, here's what you can tell the manufacturers that it must be safe because our team used a bug tracker and used source control and uh, used <laughs> some you automated, you know, severity <laughs> maybe as a code quality metric, right. uh, just for instance. Um, and that's wonderful, but you have to trust that the team did their job. That's right. Uh, and without very much visibility into that team and without, you know, it's very hard for a third party to verify that a bunch of humans did an activity correctly. Um, the idea with formal methods is you don't have to trust um, the process that created the artifact, but you could do a test on the artifact um, that would prove the properties about it. Uh, is this, so that, is this form of verification uh, commonplace in the auto industry? I mean, are they aware of this even? Uh, th th there's some awareness. So the the as far as I know, the main application that you know across software world in general is uh, static analysis mm -hmm. so the idea um, you know uh, that there's v vendors who have tools that will run over your your so source code and try to find vulnerabilities there's a two problems with this in general though so um, they're great and everyone should be doing this um, the tools have really come along but they give a large number of um, both false positives and false negatives so, you know, you might see a whole bunch of reports, but the engineers, you, you start, gla your eyes glaze over because there's, um, you know, too many false, uh, false positives. Positives, yeah. The other, the other problem is that um, one might argue that this is at uh, too low of a level uh, for some of the properties that we care about. So, you know, all you can really, it's not going to tell you, does your software implement the function that you implement? Because that's in your, in your mind, or it might be in comments, or maybe there's a couple of assertions. Um, and so this is really just saying, have you written your C or C++ correctly? And so some of the verification work, and, and the most important verification work is that um, the architectural level. So looking at things like data flow, looking at things like the networking. And so, you know, uh, we're, we're doing work and research in that area as well. Uh, so before you even write a line of code, is your design correct? Um, there's a nice uh, paper uh, from Amazon actually recently about using, they've recently taken up formal verification in designing some of their highly distributed um, uh, algorithms for uh, uh, um, the, the I think data centers. Yeah, a lot of those are for databases where the algorithms are really just too complex for a human That's to fit right. in their head. And it's not even about the source code at that point. And they, so they talk about the benefits of using you know, formal methods tools to find out, is this algorithm e going to work? Is there, are there bugs in it before they even write a line of code? Because it, once you've written the code, it's kind of game over. It's so hard to go back, try to fix bugs if there's a, if a fundamental design flaw up front. I wonder so, if heads of state <laughs> in their in their big armored limousines, they must. I mean, there must be uh, somewhere somebody who's really paying attention to this. They would be uh, targets, I would imagine. Uh, I don't know anything about that in specific. Um, <laughs> I'm just thinking that it seems like a, a real great opportunity for uh, bad guys. Um, and and I think you make an interesting point that the the methodologies that are used currently in software development for for PCs, just, it's just not going to be sufficient That's right. for this kind of platform. 
Right. The, um, I, I guess saw in the one stance of, on security needs to take it from the beginning yeah. uh, to produce a secure system. Security isn't something you can bolt on <laughs> afterwards. We've talked about that a lot, haven't we, Steve? So, yeah. So, okay, in one of the papers, I actually saw an acronym that chilled my blood. And I, I needed, I'm glad I have you guys on the line because there isn't actually an SQL, a, a, a SQL server in any cars today, is there? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, who knows? Um, if you have an MP3 player in your car, that might be a Linux application that's backed by SQLite. I, I, I would implement it that way, probably. Uh, oh. <laughs> and it's certainly in your phone, so. Yeah. Yeah. So why not? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, because there, there, there was a mention of, of of SQL injection attacks, and I thought, oh my lord, we really, we really aren't <laughs> learning. to cover anything. everything. <laughs> so I'm I'm curious uh, as as uh, you know, we talk about start talking about autonomous vehicles. Um, before this, of, I mean, I don't think an autonomous vehicle is necessarily more vulnerable. Um, if you could take over the system, you could take over the system. Doesn't matter if a human or a computer is driving. But I wonder if that the the move towards autonomous vehicles will support you guys, in the sense that people are going to be more aware of the potential risks and they're going to pay more attention to um, uh, correctness yeah. and so forth. So, uh, it, certainly, a vehicle being autonomous helps people think of that problem a lot more clearly. Like, okay, I'm going to be giving it commands from my desk, right. uh, but how do right. I know somebody else can't do that? Right. Um, it, it helps break away that abstraction of the human being in control by proximity. But uh, as far as like certification goes or the culture of security goes, um, I think that's just totally on a case-by-case -case basis, whether the people building that particular system uh, cared about this enough or whether they didn't. Right. But I would actually argue that, uh, you know, autonomy, it, it introduces yet another vector of attack. So right. there's you know, just a whole bunch of software there. And then furthermore, now we're talking about a whole bunch of additional sensors uh, that your vehicle, you know, aircraft or automobile is now dependent on. So, um, you know, if I, you know, your, your, GP, your GPS, your car might use GPS coordinates to help you navigate, but if your car is actually using GPS to uh, the autopilot to navigate, well, then, you know, we have to think about what happens when there's a denial of service or someone's, um, right. Uh, uh, attacking some of the sensors. Yeah, and it's interesting, you also mentioned it's not merely to take over the car to steal it or to disable the brakes to kill the, the occupant. It could be a privacy it, right. it used to invade privacy as well. That's right. And there's even, uh, you know, new standards that are being proposed by the Department of Transportation. So, you know, vehicle to vehicle uh, communication is what it's called. The idea that uh, this allows, you know, regardless of the make or manufacture, different vehicles to communicate with each other so that you can do collision avoidance is one of the main use cases. Mm, right. But this is, you know, it's, so there's a nice safety argument for this. On the other hand, um, you can use the same infrastructure, uh, perhaps if it's not implemented correctly, to track vehicles. So if every vehicle is broadcasting where it is, if everything's using a public key infrastructure and it's not done correctly, uh, you might be able to, to determine, you know, where is someone going, what are they doing, um, uh, without uh, having to say physically bug the, the right. vehicle. We've seen over the years lots of attacks that, without attacking the PKI specifically, uh, there are various other ways that you could differentiate certain cars from each other, or cer sorry, certain computers from each other, and. Uh, make very educated guesses about um, that being the same computer as you saw before. Well, this is exciting, isn't it, Steve? <laughs> isn't that special? Uh, um, really, it's I've, what I find interesting is is uh, is uh, Lee and Pat's uh, background and kind of almost a, a higher level of academic uh, uh, research. Uh, yes, you know, and and this 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 correct proving the software correct and. And so forth. Uh, and it sounds like we need to we need to use a variety of disciplines to uh, in going forward to protect ourselves. Uh, and and you know it's not frankly not just cars anymore. Everything uh, could be elevators next. Yeah. Well, and <laughs> they have a they have a, a great paper. I, I linked to it uh, in my uh, Twitter feed titled "Securing the Automobile: A Comprehensive Approach," which is um, a, like you know maybe 
Uh, oh, it's 10 pages long, although the last page is all references. It looks like maybe the last two pages are all references. Um, and, and it is exactly that. It's, you know, it's academic and scholarly, and it talks about the, the development of, of formal, formal software proofs for the correctness of this. And, and I, I guess I, I like it because I'm glad that DARPA is once again spending taxpayer money to to encourage individuals with the proper experience and talent sets uh, and 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 backgrounds to to consider how we fix this in the future maybe not today maybe not you know the next model year's car but at some point it it'll probably be some some catastrophe that occurs, as is so often the case, that finally is a wake-up call and makes Congress move and puts a mandate in, and we'll be annoyed that it'll have a 10-year uh, implementation horizon, but the automakers will have uh, argued that that's how long it takes to move the whole supply chain up, and, you know, a decade later, we'll, we have, may have the, the fruits of the labor that these guys are, are investing in right now. Lee, you're, are you any relation to Rob Pike? Uh, not that I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just chat room wanted to know. And, you know, there's an article in the Huffington Post, uh, Richard Clark, uh, uh, national security expert advisor to many presidents, uh, speculating that uh, a journalist who was killed in an early morning, uh, morning auto accident last week might have been killed. He said it was consistent with a car cyber attack. Mm -hmm. So, it, <laughs> I mean, I think that may be a little bit of sensationalistic but uh it's, it, it, i wonder how long before this kind of stuff starts hitting the uh so we're calling the them cyber physical cyber, cyber physical, physical. Attacks, right? yeah yeah wow. that's, that's okay. what these we, guys we, are experts we, in we will add that to our lexicon <laughs> <laughs> hey it's great Thanks to talk to much, you guys. lee pike pat hickey from galois g-a-l-o-i-s dot uh, com really appreciate your taking the time to uh, join us today Thanks for having no us. No problem. Thank you. What, Thanks, a, guys. what an interesting subject. I just I find that fascinating. I really we've kind of talked about this before. The idea of uh, proof uh, proof of correctness in software. Yeah. Uh, which really does seem like the realm of of the academic as a uh, but if it's possible. Well, you know. yeah, and 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 I think Lee put it exactly right, and that is it's it's a little bit like the puzzle I solved the the, the, the longest repeating strings problem. Because and because some people tweeted back and said, "Oh, that's been solved. It's it's on Wikipedia." And it's like, yes, it's been solved for toy problem sets, right, right. like for very small corpuses. It's trivial to do. You build a um, a, a substring tree essentially, and and then you just ask that tree where the longest repeating string is, and the tree expresses it. The problem is, for a huge corpus, you can't build the tree. Because the, the, the size of the tree explodes. Similarly, you can do the trivial software proving systems that can prove that w where you express what an algorithm is going to do, the software is able to take that, that machine definition expression and analyze the algorithm and, and verify it. And exactly as Lee said, the problem is it doesn't scale. You, it just, I mean, it, it, or, or I, I should say, until recently, we haven't had the 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 power of the of the computers and the RAM necessary and the formal attention. There, there's a, again in in this DARPA presentation, it shows an exponential improvement in the in the in the strength of software-based correctness proving and there essentially in the last 10 years there's been a break a, a series of breakthroughs that have made it far more practical to begin to apply this kind of technique where you can finally say definitively you you, you have a, a definitive counter argument to the complaint that all software has bugs yeah. it's like well yeah. we we can actually mathematically prove that some doesn't Fascinating, Steve. What a sh what a great show! Thank you. Absolutely, Lots I, of fun. I I was so tickled to get the email from these guys saying, "Hey, uh, we watch Security Now, and we're the guys that were on 60 Minutes." So cool. I'm glad we could have them. You know, yeah. put, put 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 a face behind the story. G a l o i s dot com. Steve Gibson is at grc.com. That's where you'll find the 
uh, Spinrite, the world's best hard drive maintenance and yep. recovery utility. All his great freebies. More work on Squirrel coming down the pike. It's getting getting exciting now. Yep, we got iOS clients and Mac clients and a whole bunch of different uh, uh, web server platforms. So we're getting there. You can also uh, leave questions for him next week if, uh, <laughs> <laughs> if the good Lord willing and the creeks don't rise. We'll have a Q&A episode. Go to grc.com slash feedback to leave your question or tweet Steve at, G at SGGRC and uh, we'll try to get your questions on. Steve has 16 kilobit audio versions of this show on his site, along with great transcriptions from Elaine Ferris. Uh, we have full quality MP3s and video and all of that stuff at twit.tv slash SN. You can also subscribe to uh, any of those formats uh, on iTunes or whatever you use on your on your smartphone or your, your mobile device. Uh, but do subscribe because you don't want to miss an episode. Uh, and you don't want to be one of those people who says, Steve, I've started listening at episode one. <laughs> now you'll you're but there's almost 500 yeah. it's gonna take you a while subscribe now and, yeah there are like when we did that set on how the internet works and yeah. how cpus some good stuff. Remember, yeah. remember, remember the whole processor architecture stuff yeah. there there's some there's some gems back there thanks steve we'll see you next time on security thanks leo